right about now. Weasel check him out now. Got a field tent, weasel right about now. The real tent, weasel check him out now. Got a field tent, weasel. I gotta ask cause I'm curious. You rapping so fast, so furious. Are you Vin Diesel? Nah, man. Tin Weasel. Right about now. So, the real uh, tin. So now I know I can say whatever I want. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> Free to be me. Woo! Okay, so uh, I will now expound. Because, you know, at some point in time, these things will be valuable. Collectible, even. I imagine. Maybe. So, uh, <clears throat> so I want to get off. You know, last time, what did I talk about? Last time I talked about religion. Eh, bummer, you know. Politics and religion. Never, never talk about those. And, uh, my IQ to establish, you know, uh, a baseline, I guess, for why I think I have, why I would have the gall to think I can comment on things. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, um, this time I want to get off on some, on a different subject. You know, it's kind of just a bummer, you know, the religious stuff, you know. Uh, Let's get, let's get off that. Let's, let's, let's get into something that, um, I think that, you know, even, even, uh, you know, definitely a lot of, you know, high IQs are into physics, quantum mechanics, science in general. Um, you know, it, it describes the world around us. You know, it's, it's, uh, does it get kind of abstract and difficult to picture, you know, some of these things, especially stuff on a quantum level that, that, that we can't even literally picture. We don't have, there's no camera. They can get down to the level of a, an electron microscope. But uh, beyond that, uh, it's, it's pretty much just, uh, you know, determined abstractly, like the, like the, the makeup of an atom. So let's just jump, jump right into, into that. So I think a lot of people are interested in it that, that aren't, you know, in, in uh, you know, geeks like me. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I've, I, I try, <coughs> excuse me, I read a lot of science stuff and a lot of times the, it doesn't seem like there's any effort, you know, to put it into terms that, that, uh, most people can understand, you know, it's, it's like in their own language and it's very difficult for me and I imagine for others to, to comprehend. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had to read a lot of stuff to get to a point where I could tell it to myself in a, in a layman's term, terms. And, uh, and until I got there, I didn't really feel like I understood it. It, w- it was just kind of like esoteric in a way. It's, um, so, uh, so let, let, let me, tr- let me try, to, let, let me tell you about some of the things I found in, most interesting and exciting, uh, when I started, um, uh, researching uh this stuff and uh and i'll try to put it in terms uh, i'll i'll put it ha- how i eventually uh um refined it for myself to make it the most honest so i grasp it best um uh, we'll, we'll just i'll just explain it from that viewpoint rather than anywhere along that path unless i'm describing how i got to um to that ultimate description so uh Let's, let's start with, uh, something I find very interesting. I don't think most people understand. I certainly did not. Um, the world around us, atoms. So we're, we're all probably familiar with, you know, the, the picture of the atom. You know, it's got a nucleus and then it's got, uh, electrons buzzing around it in a slight, almost like a, uh, like a solar system with the sun being the nucleus and then the planets orbiting like electrons. And that's sort of how, uh, uh, school has, has put that image. That image comes from a guy named Niels, Niles Bohr, who was, a uh, uh, a Jewish friend of Einstein's who got, uh, uh, who got the Nobel Prize, I believe in 1922, uh, for his, uh, his atom. Now he never saw an atom. So how did he know what it looked like? Inference. <laughs> Inference. And I don't want to get too much on, into ha- how all that, you know, went into, but I just, just, just know that nobody actually saw or has seen 
an atom nucleus. Um, we have the, the Large Hadron Collider where we, where we smash atoms together, or, or I'm sorry, protons, uh, uh, particles together and, and view the, the, the pieces. But the viewing isn't, isn't a picture picture. <laughs> a little different. It's, uh, it, it's not the same thing. Um, and, and, and there's no way to, to view something on that level due, due to something called the Planck length. Max Planck was a contemporary of Einstein. And what that dude came up with was pretty ingenious. He said, if you take, you know, particles, there's a, there's, there's, there's a limit to how much we can know about something that small. And the main reason for that limit is the photon. The photon is the only way we can tell that something is, the, we can get information about something else around us. The only way, really, on that scale is the photon. And, and so what do we do when we, when we look at something, what are we looking at? We're looking at things at photons bouncing off of it. Little photons, little packets of energy that Einstein is the one who discovered come in a quanta state. What is a quanta state? A quanta, a quant, quantum means that it's, that it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, it's not looking what quantum means. It, when we see something, we bounce a photon off. And, with that photon, then that photon hits, or at some point, our retina, and that retina um, sends an electrical signal to our brain, telling our eyes to see something, a pixel of color, perhaps. And so, uh, so you know, and then we look when we look on a, under an electron microscope, um, the same thing. It gets to our eye via via uh, the um, uh, the the lens. And then, but it still tells us what to see. It just hits and says, okay, this pixel in your field of vision is this color. That's it. And so now photons carry energy and they're quantized. What, is, what does that mean? Quantized means they come in discrete amounts. That there's a low amount. And then to go up from that amount, you can own, there's a minimum amount of energy that any, um, that any light signal can have and it can't be smaller than that we know that and when you go up from that to the next amount of energy that that uh, uh, light can have it can only go up by that minimum amount as though it comes in particles and each particle is that energy amount because you can't go below it and you can't go above it More, you can't go above it except for in that discrete amount Meaning that it must be contained in particles that have a minimum value of that energy level. That's how we determine it without actually seeing it. That's how we know. So we shoot this little energy packet called a photon at a thing to see it. It bounces off and comes back to our retina or via a lens and a microscope or something. And, uh, and it tells us, you know, this pixel is, is this value. There's no way. For us to send a little messenger out without and, and find out what something is um, without hitting that thing. And that hitting of the thing is a disturbance. There's energy in that photon and it hits it and causes a reaction. You know, uh, when uh, a force hits something, it, it reacts with the equal and opposite force. So that now you've changed the direction and... Um, of of the the photon, it's now move. It's not where it is any. Or I'm sorry, the uh, thing that you're looking at. And if the thing that you're looking at is a particle, then that that photon, you know, that hitting it with that photon may knock it a long way away. <laughs> you know, you disturbed it a lot by looking at it, and you can't observe it without doing that. So there's no way to. And now we don't know what, whatever value we got after hitting with the photon and then analyzing. And it wouldn't just be one photon; it'd be a bunch of photons and all their collective energy hitting it. And then we get that information back from the photon and we know what it looked like now and where it's at, but it's not there anymore. And where is it now? Well, we can do some calculations where we hit it with this much energy, then it should react this way, but we don't know for certain where it is. It's, it's, it's a range of values that it could be now. And so because we didn't, and there's no way for a certain, certain, certain to nail down where it was at the time we hit it. Why? 
Well, because we can't see anything narrower than a photon. If, if we're trying to look with a photon at something that's smaller than a photon, well, then it's going to be, you know, we can't hit. It, it's difficult to hit it head on, right? And get that photon back. We might have a glancing blow. And for things really, really much, you know, a lot smaller than a photon, we can't really get any. It's not enough to to ricochet the photon back at us. We can't even see. So we'll never know what that thing is. So we can't describe it. We can't explain it. And that's why things on a small. So the Planck length is essentially, you know, the length that a photon can send back information on the, the, the size of a thing. That can, the photon can report information on. If it's too small, then we can never know what it is because there's nothing that we can send at it that will send us back information about that thing. And that essentially is, is what the Planck length is. It's, it's saying anything smaller than this, we can never truly know the value of. It's just, it's a mystery. And then, uh, 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 that was exp- expounded on, I guess, by, um, oh, what was that cat's name? Um, uh, the uncertainty principle. What was that, dude? Anyway, the uncertainty principle works in tangent with that. And the uncertainty principle says uh, that uh, because we can't know these things, we can never, um, we can never know the true. We can never know where anything is precisely at any present moment. Uh, we can't know it's, uh, it's, it's. Um, Angular momentum plus its position and, and its speed. Or is that, is that right? Uh, I think that's, I think angular momentum and speed are the same thing for, for our purposes here. So we, we can't know, we can't know all of the values of a thing, where it is, how, what direction it's moving and how fast it's moving. So I, th- I think that is what it is. So, uh, so it's, it's uncertainty. We have, there's a, there's a certain level of uncertainty in everything, which means we can, oh, we, we can't say for sure. <laughs> we can't describe the universe around us per, uh, perfectly at any given time. If we can't describe things perfectly at any given time, we can't know at, in the future. We can't perfectly predict where it's going to be. So everything has an uncertainty value built in. The way, the way this is constructed around us has an uncertainty value built in. And all we can do is give a range of probabilities for where that thing is and where it's going to be. And that's, that's essentially what, uh, what, what that boils down to. So understanding that to some degree, um, we, we, we now move to the, uh, to the atom. Um, so the atom is a nucleus. And what is that nucleus made of? The nucleus is made of, um, tangible things. Uh, they're called fermions. We know them as mass, uh, and uh, so fermions are just par- particle, particles containing mass, um, and they're affected by the Higgs uh, field and the Higgs boson, which was discovered about a decade ago um, in the, in the uh, Large Hadron Collider, and uh, so we know it, it, that 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 uh, Higgs theory about mass is real. That this particle, uh, that the Higgs field gives. Uh, fermions mass and it, it imparts mass to those particles and the, only, the ones that don't have mass um, are not affected by the field so um, so the atom is comprised of a particle uh, or rather <clears throat> a, a nucleus that contains uh, protons and neutrons except in the case of the, the uh, hydrogen atom which uh, doesn't have a neutron that's just a proton, um, with an atomic weight of one. Uh, so, so, uh, and, and when a proton we know is, is comprised of quarks, whether it gets smaller than that, uh, we don't really know. But quarks contain mass, so they're, uh, tangible. And then what else is in, in an atom? Well, let's just take that hydrogen atom that doesn't even have any neutrons to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and so its nucleus has a proton. It's got some, it's a fermion, it's got some mass, and then there's a shell around it containing an electron, a single electron. Now, is that like a sun and an, and a planet? It's not. Even though we have, you know, those little models in the science classrooms that's got that, uh, that looks like a solar system, 
um, that a, a, a an electron until its wave function collapses, and don't even worry about that right now, but just understand, a, a an electron is a is a wave, and that wave function means that it has um, that it's smeared out. That basically is a force field. It's not something orbiting a center. It's 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 a force field, and if you try, you know, you know, to uh, <clears throat> and other atoms cannot uh, breach that force field um, for for various reasons. But let's just get into the reason. That force field has a uh, an electron is electric, right? Um, by nature, it's where the word electricity comes from. Electron. It's the smallest quantum component of electricity the smallest discrete packet that that energy can come in is an electron now um and and the electron can gain energy from for example being hit by a photon and when it does it can only go by the go up in energy value by the discrete amount um the a quantized amount that that uh that the photon energy contains and when it does that it rate it it will often go up in value, meaning that it goes to a higher level of an electron shell. Electron shell uh, is is the the areas of, um, outside of the nucleus where electrons can exist and they can only go up by quantized values, energy values. <clears throat> when it goes up in value, it normally wants to go down because its natural state of being is in the lowest position in the shell, the uh, the natural state uh, where it, where it, where it originally exists. So it will spit back out that photon, but that new photon that it got after it gets hit with the photon and uh, absorbs that energy, when it releases a photon, the new photon contains information about that atom. Its frequency will be related to not what hit it, but what, uh, value the, uh, the, the nucleus, the information the nucleus has about that, about the properties of that atom. So, <clears throat> so it, now, how far away is that force field, that electron shell, from that nucleus? It's a long way away. If we were to blow up the nucleus of an atom to the size of a grain of sand, the nearest, the, the electron shell, the lowest level of the electron shell surrounding that grain of sand would be miles away. All of that empty space, nothing at all in between it. We're all made up of atoms, and those atoms are 99.9999999, whatever, a lot of nines, percent, nothing at all. It's a force field surrounding a tiny bit of information in the form of quarks, which comprise an atom, like DNA. It's a code that gives, that, that contains information about the properties of that atom, what it's going to look like when we look at it. So, and, and you know, so a black hole and a neutron star, these things out there that have really high gravity, what's happened to those things that makes their gravity so dense and so um, uh, compacted and strong is that they lost, the, the gravity got so strong that they lost, that the electron shell collapsed around their atoms and they went down to just the nucleus. All that empty space disappeared and it's that dense. That's what makes a black hole's gravity so strong even light can't escape it. <clears throat> so, but the world around us isn't compacted yet. It's just this empty space. All the atoms of your body are 99.9999% that empty space. And the reason that the atoms around it don't collapse it is because of the repulsive force of electromagnetism from the electron shells. So your component atoms of your body ha are just little tiny nucleus, a grain of sand with miles distance to the electron shell, and that electron shell is surrounded with other atoms, electron shells, who also have miles to their grain of sand nucleus. When we shrink, shrink them back down to their normal size, it's not the size of a grain of sand, this nucleus, it's, it's trillions, quadrillions of times, you know, smaller. But the, the, the point remains that if we, if we collapse the entire earth and all its, you know, everything on the surface, all the magma in the center of the iron core, the, if we collapse everything that we know on this planet down to just its nucleuses, if we broke all those electron shells by having gravity so strong that it forced that to happen and overwhelmed the repulsive electromagnetic force of the negative um, magnetic charge of the 
electrons a- around the atoms, it would the entire Earth and everything in it would be this this the size of a soccer ball, a soccer ball. The same, but it would have the same gravity, just that dense, and it would form a black hole probably eventually. It would maybe not. I guess it would just stay in place, wouldn't it? it it's, its gravity wouldn't change, so it would just keep orbiting the sun as is, and it doesn't have enough mass, um, the Earth to uh, to form a black hole. So, which means it would never actually collapse its electron shells. So this is, you know, just postulating. But just to give you an idea, so, so when you, so why, if we're all 99.999% nothing, when we push our finger against a wall, why doesn't our hand go right through it? It should go right through it. The wall is just a bunch of, you know, um, little grains of sand shrunken down with tons of space between that and its force field electron shell. So, well, it doesn't go through it for the same reason that its atoms don't collapse on themselves. Because the repulsive force of the uh, negative magnetism of the of the uh, electron shell. So when you push our finger against the wall, it's we're, we're feeling a pushback. It's not solid. It's actually pushing back. It's resisting our finger, and our finger is resisting it as well. The atoms of our finger are saying, no, I can't. Just like when you take two negative, you know, poles of magnets and try to push them together, it resists. And that's all that's happening. Resistance. So, but in essence, there's, it's, there's nothing really there except the force of electromagnetism, which is the same thing that the, that light is made of. Photons. They're electromagnetic. Um, they're, they're wavelengths in the ele- electromagnetic spectrum that includes, uh, um, everything, x-rays, uh, radio waves, uh, uh, microwaves, um, gamma rays, ultraviolet. So the world around us is really sort of an illusion. You know, things look solid, but they're not. That's just, that's just what, what the information, the photons in our retina tells us to see. Um, so it, it, in a very true sense, our world is not much different than an, a video game. When you look at a video game, all we're seeing is light representing things that aren't solid, that aren't real, that are just light. When we see things in the world around us, we're seeing um, things that aren't solid, that aren't real. Um, it, it's a very, it's a, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a shortcut way to create a universe, if you ask me. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and just like in a video game, when you try to walk into another character on a screen, it doesn't let you do that. And the reason it doesn't let you do that is because, uh, the programmer would have programmed something in to disallow it. Some way to recognize that your character is, is now trying to walk across a space where another character currently sits or a thing, a tree, an item, an asteroid. And it won't let you do that based on some sort of programming it otherwise you 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 walk across it or through it or something and then it would seem very strange um so in our world too this reality has uh something built into the programming that uh disallows um uh two things to occupy the same space it's called the the fermi exclusion principle and what that says is that uh no two fermions, meaning mass, can occupy the same position at the same energy. Uh, and that's the same thing. It's a programming rule, essentially, of, of this universe we live in. So we can't, wa- so, so we can't, our, our, we, we can't go through the thing. So it feels resistance due to electromagnetism. We can't occupy the same space as these other things. So it seems real based on these rules. And, uh, and what we see is based on photons sending our retina, um, f- certain frequencies, which we perceive as pixels in our field of vision, um, that correspond with, with these, uh, uh, with these electromagnetic repulsions where it seems that thing is real because it's repulsing our ability to push into it. Um, I tripped out. The first time I really, like, that clicked for me. Like, whoa, whoa. 
It's, uh, it might have been the first time I thought, oh, are we living in a simulation? You know, is this a program? Um, and I've gone down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Boy, have I, I thought about that in depth. Um, so, so now, now, now we understand, um, hopefully, you got him a little bit. It took me, it took me a long time to, to really let that click and, and it might for you as well. Um, kind of trip, just staring at a wall, pushing at it. Just look at that. That's, that's just a bunch of, a bunch of nothing there. <laughs> for example, uh, there's, there's, uh, 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 particles in the universe called neutrinos. And these, ne these neutrinos are unusual, um, because they, they have no, uh, electric charge. They're neutral. So what that means is they don't interact like the, like, like other matter does with the electron shells. They don't, they don't have electron. They don't have an, a, a negative charge. So they're not going to be repulsed and, and they'll go right through us, you know? And here's a trippy thing. So, so take something really dense like lead. Lead, what does being dense mean? It means that it's, uh, it means that it's atoms are packed closer together, which means there's more nucleuses, um, to possibly interact with. Now, the only thing a neutrino can interact with when it goes through something, since it has no electrical charge, all that empty space between nucleuses that comprise our bodies and everything else with matter, all that empty space, um, the neutrinos just pass right through because it doesn't see the electron shells in a sense. The only thing that it can interact with is if it hits a nucleus head on. And then it, there'll be a reaction and it'll come up in a, in a particle detector. Um, and we've set these particle detectors up all over the place to try to, you know, detect these neutrinos and, and find out more about neutrinos. Um, and we can, so, so we can like take the densest material, like with the most, um, uh, nucleuses per square inch, I guess. Uh, and, and we can send, and neutrinos like trillions from the sun pass through our bodies every second. And trillions pass through, uh, something the size of our bodies, uh, uh every second too, anywhere that's, that's, you know, that, that gets light from the sun. So, and we've set up lead, which is denser than our bodies, obviously, meaning more n nucleuses. Um, and an entire year can pass with trillions of neutrinos passing through this material and never once hitting a single nucleus, not a single reaction. So that, that just gives you an idea of how empty it is and how, you know, how little, yeah, that just, uh, for, for, for me, that, that creates a pretty good vi visual of just how it's really nothing, man. It's, it's no more substantial. All this stuff is no more substantial than, than just like the screen of a video game with just some lit up pixels, you know, representing something solid and real. That's just, we flip off the screen and, oh, that was just all light photons. Oh man, trip on that. So, um, next time we'll, we'll, uh, talk about, uh, the speed of light. Einstein's theories, um, and maybe delve into quantum mechanics a little bit. Um, and, uh, maybe one day, um, this will be helpful to someone. I know I, I spent years researching things that weren't, that weren't, uh, uh, readily accessible. I, it took me like over a year of looking to answer the question that I, I couldn't, that the question that the speed of light, um, um, uh, I couldn't find any of this. Now, this is before the internet was as, you know, widespread. The, the internet hadn't hit everywhere yet. And I, I was trying to find out why, if light, um, has no mass, why it's affected by gravity. Why, why would light bend around the gravity of a planet or a star if it doesn't have any mass? And if, uh, if, if, if mass is what gravity affects. And I could, it took me literally years of asking that question to like physics professors and stuff. You know, I would find their email addresses and email them and ask. And I never really got a satisfactory answer until one day I did. Until one day I did. And, and now I understand it. And 
And so maybe, um, and I'll talk about that the next time. And, and maybe somebody who was in my shoes then and has similar questions will, will stumble across it. And, and, you know, if one person saves himself those years of looking, then, then this is worth it. Okay. Over and out. Right about now, the real tin weasel, check him out now. Got a field tin 